Oh, look at you two. First, second, what is this? Uh, a forum of some kind? Hello, happy Sunday. Welcome to Logic Live 114. It is good to see some wonderful names here in the chat. Austin Campbell, he is first. Jason Zhang is second. David Kreitz, Carlos Campos, Michael Landon. Look at all these names. Valentin Andreev, hello. FlyFX, Jess, she's across the room right now. BJH, hello everyone. We have a hell of a show here. Uh, I did my run through with, with Richard last night and man, I got even more excited about everything he's gonna show. It's gonna be great. Andy Milkis himself is here in the chat. That's something of a celebrity. Hello. Hope everyone's enjoying this beautiful, beautiful Sunday. Oh, levels are good. Good to know. Good to know. Man, I never know when this song is going to be over. I think it's now. Wow, that was pretty good. I think I nailed it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Logic Live 114. I am your host, Jeff Kyle. And before we get into the thick of it, I would love to share with you some updates and some messages from our sponsors. So we are going to switch over to the slideshow. This episode of Logic Live is brought to you by AJA, together with Flame, since 2006. Where is my mouse? There it is. Uh, Hot Spring is the future of VFX outsourcing. You can work with them to connect you with other artists from around the world to help get your projects done. You can find them at thehotspring.com. If you need Boris FX plugins, or if you were swayed by our last episode where Boris FX stopped by to talk about their exciting new features, you can save 15% on any Boris FX product, standalone or subscription, with the code LOGIC2023 at checkout. LOGIC-2023. If you enjoy swagging out with Logic Swag, we have a merch store with an excellent collection of hoodies, shirts, mugs, stickers, and more. And a few weeks ago, we added a few new exciting items. We now have Logic Notebooks, AirPod cases, iPhone and Android phone cases. And if you perked up when I mentioned the Logic Notebook, well, you are in luck because that is what we will be giving away at the end of the show today, so long as you are registered for the show. So you can find the merch store on the Logic.tv website with the merch button at the top of the page. Thank you to all of the patrons who are subscribed on Patreon. Your support is what allows Logic Live to happen and what allows the Logic com community to thrive and grow. Look at that list. The list just keeps growing. And I happen to know who one of these new patrons is, my esteemed coworker, the incredible nuke lead Jason Sang, who's dipping his big toe into flame and is here in the chat today. So if you see him around, give him a warm welcome. Really great guy, love working with him. Aside from that, thank you everyone who subscribed, making this Logic community that I'm happy to be a part of a reality. We are up to a whopping 163 patrons as of this week. If you'd like to support what we're doing here on Logic, not only do you get the peace of mind of contributing to a great community, but you also get access to some exclusive content, such as the post-show Q&A, where, for instance, after this show, we'll be heading on over to Zoom, chat some more with Richard to answer any specific questions you might have about anything he's showing today, or maybe even just pick his brain about something else. Head on over to patreon.com slash logic tv and support for as little as five bucks a month. Don't forget about the logic forum and this slide has been new and improved to showcase dark mode which is my layout of choice for the forums. The forums are the go-to place to ask questions, have conversations, and learn more about others, uh, what others in the community have to say. Goes hand in hand with our discord server of course. If you aren't there already, think about stopping by. That's where you can find your day-to-day -day flame chats, questions, comments, hangouts. A little more conversational than the forums and a great way to ask a one-off question that doesn't need to get immortalized into the forums. Join the conversation today and click the Discord link at forum.logic.tv and come on over. Every week, more challenge coin shipments make their way to happy patrons' doorsteps. If you didn't know already, all patrons who are subscribed at the HD level or higher get a challenge coin, which is a hell of a deal if you ask me. If you're the proud owner of a new challenge coin, it's always fun to share pictures of them on your desk, in front of your flame, or even, um, I don't know how many more times I can milk this joke, but uh, uh, this could be you, the one lucky winner of the fabled Logic Challenge Coin bodysuit premiered at NAB. And speaking of challenge, Glenn Teal has accepted the challenge of helping produce Logic podcast episodes. He's been doing an amazing job getting these underway with Amanda Elliott. We'll be releasing new episodes all the time. If you aren't caught up, there's roughly 39 episodes of goodness up there. Interviews with flame artists, producers, post-production people. Good stories, good people, good content. If anyone has any suggestions for podcast topics or interview subjects, shoot a message over to Glenn on the forum. He's the man for that. He can make it happen. 
And we're talking about, while we're talking about making things happen, let's talk about some new tutorials that have happened over at Logic Academy. May not be winter anymore, but we've had a few solid new tutorials from over the past months. Sinan Viral's Flame Particle System Part 2. Sinan, who is an amazing flame artist, does a, a great job showing what you can do with Flame's particle system. and expands upon some of the ideas from his first uh, particle tutorial video, uh, how to use particles in flame. New tutorial number two is by Graziella Gandalfi, covering intro to matchbox shaders. She walks us through how she writes matchbox shaders and talks you through some of the more complicated theoretical concepts so you can understand what's going on and why. Does an excellent job giving you the chance to make some matchbox shaders of your own, which I think is really cool. These two videos join the rest of the Logic Academy series. There they are. There are almost too many to name as we, as we add to the list. Uh, if any of these sound cool, check them out because they are all available for free on the Logic YouTube channel. Big shout out and thank you to Autodesk for sponsoring those videos. And speaking of Autodesk, Flame 2024 has become available for download just a few weeks ago, so don't forget to upgrade if your schedule allows you to do so. I know that's on my list of things to do this week when our engineering lead gets back from vacation, so that's my personal addition to that. Uh, some really solid new features with 2024 that I know a thing or two about. If you want to know some more about said features, head on over to the Flame Learning Channel. I am a visual learner, and tutorials are one of my favorite ways to learn. Pause the video, slow it down, speed it up, thumb through to get to the relevant sections. I had the honor and privilege of being your tutorial creator for these new features, covering some of the more exciting 2024 features like the start frame metadata, metadata overlay, paint node improvements, and paste special. Let me know if you found them useful uh, or if you have any feedback for me. Otherwise, on to the main attraction, today's episode. Hello. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you're new to Logic Live, you might not know his name, but if you've been around a bit, he's a household name in my book. He's very active in the forums. He was made famous in the classic Logic Live episode 51, I think, where he gave what's, what feels like an infinite number of examples of uh, keying uh, in flame that I think a lot of people have used and uh, are very, uh, very, find them very useful. Uh, he's here today to show off some new things. Hello and welcome to Logic Live, Richard Betts. Hey Jeff. Hello everyone. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but while I was prepping for the show, I happened to like look at the YouTube stats stuff and did you know, I don't think you did, but maybe you did, your episode of Logic Live on keying is actually the number three most viewed video on all of Logic Live. Oh, you know that? Three. <laughs> no, only behind no. beauty the the legendary beauty techniques in flame from andy milkis and actually another oh, keying related video i forget who it was from but it was like something to do with edges but that's a that there's a lot of videos up on that that uh <laughs> that collection there yeah, it's, so it's popular, um, isn't it? yeah Green so i have to believe that people will eat this episode up when they hear what you have to say about some of the stuff you're showing um, but otherwise, before we get into that, I hope you're doing well. I know you, it's very early where you are. It's very nice of you to join us today. How are you? How, how have things been? Yeah, things are good. Yeah, uh, we're just getting into the midst of winter right here. And um, it is dark and cold at the moment. But um, but everything is going really well. We, um, we, we're busy at work, so that's nice. And um, yeah, feeling good. I'm really happy to be here and, and to show us some tricks. Yeah, man. Uh, I know... On a personal level, you have helped my coworker who's here in the chat, who's considering you to be the keying king. I think I can add that to the broadcast. The keying king. He dubs you the keying king. Um, ah, yeah. he, you helped him out with, um, I think he ended up getting 26 shots. Is that right, Austin? 26 shots of keying for a long form show that he's working on. And uh, he, he had to pull out every trick in the book. And I think talking with you is a big help. So just a testament to Richard's um, personality and how he feels about doing things. He helps people out at the drop of a hat. He's a very smart guy. Um, but that said, I think we got through a lot in nine minutes here. We're done with the introduction. We're done with our pleasantries. I, we have so much to cover today that I just want to get right into it because I was so swayed by what you showed me. I think we have to show the rest of the world, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, let's get to it. Let's get um, to it. So I was coming up with a few, uh, a few uh, techniques that I like to use. And um, I went, we ran over them uh, yesterday with Jeff and we, we, we thought I should lead with um, my love of the perspective grid. And I don't know if anyone else loves it quite as much as me, but um, I, uh, I just thought I'd go through it, how I use it and, and just ponder the question, you know, is that how, is that how you guys use it? But um, first up, um, 
I think it lends itself really well to screen tracking. So um, I'm going to start off with um, a very quick, easy demo on this screen here, just to show um, the fundamentals of it, and then I'll and then I'll move on to um, to other things. But it's just it's basically one of our planar trackers uh, that we've got in Flame. Um, very simple inside action. Just um, just pull it up, and it gives you a a grid. Uh, well, it starts with a square, and then F8 brings up a grid that you can just line up on whatever it is that you're trying to track, and then snap it, and I get my plotting and my uh, reference, and then we can analyze that. If I can interject while you're tracking here, the snap yeah. button, that was that was what was tripping me up. I forgot you had to snap, and so for the longest time I was trying to figure out what the heck was going on, but you have to snap, I think, which probably goes oh, without yeah. saying, because you're going to want to be tracking anyway. Yeah, and then snap, but also in the F8 view as well. You don't need to work in the F8 view to line it up, but F8 view gives you the grid, and it also gives you the, uh, the two reference pads. Um, the grid, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much, um, pay too much attention to it. Sometimes, depending on how you're lining up, it can sometimes disappear behind the uh, the camera plane. It's not going to do it for me now, is it? But um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't heed, pay too much uh, attention to it. Um, but yeah, it looks like it looks like we've got a really good track here. And then uh, and then when you attach anything to it, it takes on the perspective and follows the track of that grid. So this is just my screen insert. But because it's been attached to the, um, actually, what have I done here? I think I screwed it up with my, um, screwed it up with my uh, trying to make the grid pass behind it. But you attach it's a live it up. show. It's a live show, and then your um, I had a backup there. Did you see that? I was ready for it. You're backup. so prepared right now. This is great. <laughs> um, and then we're uh, we're lined up with the perspective grid and just scaling down the axes, you can see that the um, the screen insert is behaving as if it was on that right perspective and it will um, it will now track with the uh, with the phone. But that's not actually how I use it. I actually use it more for um, stabilizing, then working on things and then taking the move off. In fact, most of what I call my tricks involve me stabilizing something somewhere, doing the work on it and then putting the move back on. So yeah, um, let's Let's pretend that we've just done the track and we are unhidden. Let's just hide that. There we go. I can now bring out my background, not my screen, is it? I can bring out my background, use my perspective grid, duplicate it, attach it on, and then I can switch to 2D, which, um, oh yeah, something I should have pointed out actually is that um, the perspective grid, when we are, um, just to hanging off it will move your uh, will move your footage in 3D space. This isn't the greatest example, but you can see that it's tilting and twisting in 3D space. So that's the that's the distinction between 3D and 2D. If I flick it over to 2D now, it converts all of that 3D data and keeps it in a, in a flat 2D plane. So there's no depth data in it. But and you have to those... flick it to 2D. For those oh, who sorry. might be a little confused with what you were just showing, you were showing the orthographic views. You were looking at the top view and oh, the yes. side view. Yeah, yeah. Shift, shift four, and shift. I realize that I'm I'm not the greatest tutor when it comes to hotkeys. I I teach. I, I've got a couple of juniors who I um, um you know I, I have helping me at work, and I try and show them the hotkeys, and I'm like, oh, do you know what? I've no idea what it is. Let me just put my hands on the keyboard. It's a lot of it is just. How far yeah. my fingers will reach. Muscle memory is a is a hell of a thing. And I, I can only yeah. think of one of the people I shouted out earlier, Jason, who's here in the chat for maybe one of the first times. He's kind of new to flame. He's not new to compositing, so he knows exactly what you're talking about. But when when we see what you're presenting, uh, I knew exactly that you were switching to the orthographic views. But for someone yeah, who sorry. maybe yeah. isn't so familiar with that 3D world all the time in action, yeah. it could be a bit of a... I'll try to interject when I can to try to bring it back to... People who might yes. not be super versed Around in the flame world, yeah. But going back to, I get through most of my career with stabilizing, doing the doing the paint and then putting it back on. So we've we've tracked the perspective grid, so we've got it tracked, and then I'm going to duplicate it, switch it over to two D, so that I can click invert in three D mode. It's not um, invert isn't an option, so you have to be in two D so that you can invert it, and. The only way, you know, the only real way you can tell that you've got a really good track is to stabilize it, in my opinion. So make sure you've got a really good stabilized track. And this is the this is what I love about the perspective grid. 
and this is how I use it, is that once I've got a good track, it will then uh, stabilize it, but also um, ping it out into a kind of almost straight on square view. So it's almost like the UV uh, texture if it was if it was projected onto a plane. And um, although that's not a terribly tricky shot to have tracked and stabilized, let's move on to something that's got a little bit more twist. You can see that if we if we just relied on our standard stabilizing tricks, you know, maybe um, scale and rotate. So I'm just in the stabilizer here. And unfortunately, this this is some footage I've collected from another job that I wasn't a supervisor on. But I tend to try and have my tracking markers a little bit further apart, especially when I'm doing two point stabilizing, because the further your tracking points are apart, the 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 um, the less impact any sort of errors are going to have on your stabilize. If they're really close together, then the rotation, any sort of tiny little jump in the tracking points will really send that rotation off. So I, so I tend to try and have my tracking markers a little bit further apart. So maybe I won't track that one. I'll track this one down in the bottom corner. But this is just a, an example of, you know, something that looks like it should be quite straightforward to track. There we go. And I'll just, I'll just confirm that by looking at my tracker one looks good. Tracker two looks good. So um, in the 2D stabilizer, I can I can actually look at my tracking markers and see how they have stabilized the shot. But anyway, come out. And you can see that we've got all of this kind of twisting movement. Even though I've stabilized my point down here, my point up here, so my rotation is locked, there's still a twist on the phone that you're going to have to deal with, right? So it really does need to be a planar track. And that's that's why the yeah and and I'll, I'll i'll interject as well and say as a as a mocha fanboy that i am because i was born and raised in the world of mocha uh, i really honestly didn't really know how to even use the the planar the planar tracker inside of action like the way that you are so i saw a couple tutorials of yours and i learned about it a bit but one thing that i think is great is what you just said where mochas stabilize it leaves it where it is but the perspective grid like forms it to the grid wherever the grid happens to be and like opens it up like, almost like uvs and that's pretty darn useful for a lot of things and that's something that i think mocha doesn't really do yeah i mean it might not always be what you want but but on screen inserts it just seems to scream out oh that's you know that's exactly what i need let's do it again i'll i'll, I'll, I'll do it a little bit slower but on this on this example here um so i've got my uh got my shot i'll just check it's a 68 frame range Oh, and before we go too deep, John John Ag, your buddy, wants to know for the I guess for the chat if you're sm smoke or flame hotkeys when you're calling them out. So, yeah, flame hotkey. So anytime I mention a hotkey, just uh, just remember John to ignore it completely. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so I'll pull out my uh, perspective grid. And I'll just line up my corners. Often I'll do my initial lineup on a frame that doesn't have a hand on it. <laughs> there we go. Um, and I'll line it up without the grid view. But I will switch to F8 just to make sure that I am, you know, imagine I'll over, I'll overcompensate as well. You see how I'm using all of the, uh, all of the bevel here to my advantage. Um, this bevel has got a bit of an edge. It's one of these classic edgy phones, but, um, so it might not be working in the right perspective, but I'll still use it anyway, just to calculate. There we go. Um, let's go back to the perspective grid and snap and see those two reference frames come up. Cool. And then I'm going to track backwards. Um, there are lots of options down here, so um, I'll get to another example in a second, but I tend to start off my track in the very default mode, and then I've got orders of um, progression in which I take some of these off or add some of these um, extra algorithms. Um, so I know that there's a hand coming in, so I could probably turn on occlusion that will help it um, calculate when something comes into occluded. Um, if you think that the lighting's going to change, then you know, you've got the option to uh, to um, to include that in the algorithm, or even uh, at the moment you can see from my sample. I don't know if you can see it, but you can um, see it. It's all black and white. Um, you can also analyze it in um, in RGB as well as an option. But generally, I will start with vanilla, and then I'll start tooling it up if I see it going off at all. And that also includes these uh, tracking modes as well. I'll go with the full rotation scale skew and perspective, and then as soon as it starts to wig out. I'll go to my last good frame and turn off perspective and then see how far I get. And then if it wigs out, I'll go to turn off skew and, and, and carry on like that until I limp home. And I'll, I'll explain why in a bit. But let's um, let's just track this one. Here comes the hand coming into shot. Okay, so 
instantly my reference frame has 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 gone bright red. It's not going to be able to track any further. It doesn't like that. Um, it doesn't like the the the, the uh, track because my reference frame, which was frame sixty eight, doesn't exist beyond frame twenty three. So let's go to my last good frame twenty four. Snap it again, but this time I'm going to turn on occlusions and see if it will register uh, the hand coming into shot. Okay, so not so good, but that's all right. We um, we can use G masks to exclude um, objects from the track. So obviously we should probably think about doing a G mask around the hand. So let's do that. So uh, Alt N and just do a really quick. G mask around the hand like that. I should also point out a little gotcha here that um, when you add your um, G mask, you might find it accidentally hanging off the bottom of your G mask. And that's bad because as soon as you disconnect it, you can see how it was using the track of the, it looks like it's good, but it's actually using the perspective grid. So it's picked up all the errors from the, um, from that. So just, um, just make sure you're um, not holding onto the perspective grid to make sure it's dis deselected so that when you uh, when you draw your G mask, your G mask is uh... okay. Yeah, that's like an inherent action thing, whatever you have selected. Yeah. Like, oh, it's really child. handy. Yeah. But yeah, you just, you don't want to do too much hard rotor work only to find out that it's actually attached to your uh, perspective grid, which you're just about to change. So that would be, that would be bad. These are a lot of good cool. gotchas. These are gotchas. These are good. Um, so I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna track one of these knuckles just to make my life a little bit easier. So let's go back to the frame where I created my um, G mask. Might as well turn the auto key on as well. And let's track something knuckly. Let's do something down here. Not the best tracking point, but this is just to. Uh, this is just to give my G mask a little bit of movement in the right direction. Okay, cool. Um, my G mask has been offset because I put a track on it. So I'm just gonna go to axis. And adjust that offset to put it back where it was. Right, cool. Step through. Um, a quick alteration. Just remember, this is just a holdout mat for the uh, tracking, so I don't need it to be terribly good. And Richard is using the uh, edit box, Shift E, or is that? I think that's yes. Shift E. Yeah. Why oh, is it that's Shift why... E? That's good to know. Is it? Oh. No, I don't think. No. Oh, control Control E then. One of those. Oh yeah, I like that. I like that. That's good. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, you but now I've got another hotkey that I haven't, uh, I haven't fixed. <laughs> All right, cool. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm good with that. So I'll go back to, oh, actually I should, should just bring my, so let's go back to my perspective grid and, um, F8, I can snap just before my finger comes in, go to snap, but down here we've got, um, uh, exclude G masks. And when I snap again, you might just see my finger sneaking in and, and well, maybe not. Well, let's have a look. Let's see if this uh, gets to the end. There we go. Beautiful. So now my um, now my track is not wigging out because the hand's coming into shot and we're good. So we don't really know good. it's good until we've stabilized it, but it looks good. So let's just, let's confirm that it is good by bringing in the plate, uh, duplicating the perspective grid and then turning that into 2D invert. And you should be able to see a perfectly beautifully stabilized phone. Cool. And I'll turn off my G mask as well because I don't need to cut it. Now that's great for, um, for all sorts of things now moving forward. It's great for doing your roto, you know, like especially if you've got fingers around the edge of your phone, uh, but even hands coming in, doing roto on the stabilized shot has just simplified the job immensely. I mean, I'm just about to do the cleanup on the tracking markers. Again, it's simplified it immensely. Can I just add a, a massive uh, warning to anyone though? Before you do any work on any shot that you've stabilized, just make sure you can put the move back on before you spend an hour doing any cleanup. So um, what I tend to do is I always do my uh, retracking first just to confirm that it's it's good. So I'll, I'll walk through that quickly. Um, it's a great I'm gonna tip. Attach, yeah, yeah. I've wasted many hours not doing that. Um, so I'm just going to uh, have an action with the original plate in the background. And I'm going to attach my stabilized shot, but I'm going to turn it black and white using the mono node. And that's just because if I do get it right, if I if I do it, if I do my job correctly, then I won't know that I've done it right because it will just be perfectly lined up with the background. So by making it black and white, it will be obvious. Um, and then to invert, I just need to uh, put the original 
Brecker, the original perspective grid, back on top. So let's put that back. Not on the top. duplicated one. Is that what you're saying? Duplicated one has been inverted. So I could copy that and turn off invert. It would be exactly the same. Okay, but, that um, makes sense. The original one is um, is 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 the one that has the original uh, tracking movement. So there you go. That's the that's the duplicated one, but with invert turned off. And I can confirm that, that that's all good. So now any uh, any paintwork I do. Let's do a sequence. Let's do a recursive clone. Boom, boom. And now I only need to do you know one frame of that, and then one frame of that, and that will all track back beautifully, and I can have my cleanup. Now, um, obviously, with the stabilize, do my work, and then put the move back on, you run the risk of softening the plate. So um, try and avoid that wherever possible. So in this example, I will just take my matte output of my paint strokes and just um, uh, bring up the histogram and increase the white. So I've got a really hard matte and the input will be just my paint strokes and that alpha. So that the only thing that's been stabilized and had the move put back on is those paint strokes. Yeah. Another and great tip. I'm not running. Yeah. And I'm not running the risk of, of, of softening my image because the pixels are being moved around and I only need it where I need it. Um, but again, still, still a dead easy shot. So I'm not selling it yet. Let's try something where the phone is coming into shot. We've got reflections all over it. The VFX soup. Actually, I don't think the VFX soup was on set. This is this is the uh, production going. Yeah, they need tracking markers. Let's stick a couple on and then just sticking them at the top of the phone. But you know. <laughs> well, you know, the phone goes off screen, so you won't need tracking markers at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, fine. Okay. <laughs> oh my How god. Many we got? Fifty-seven. All right. Um, I'll try and make this quick because I have got some more juicy stuff coming up, but I think it's important to show fundamentals, isn't it? Or tell I me if, you're right. if, if I've done enough. So real I, quick, real quick. I'm, as the show host, I'm always concerned with timing, but I do think you're right. I think this is important, and hopefully people also feel that way. But I think that there's not a whole lot of stuff on the perspective grid, so this is this is not bad, I think, in my my opinion. I don't want people to think that I've just taken a couple of really easy examples just to make it look, you know. Anyway. But actually, the, the, the couple of examples that I've got coming up are a little bit tricky. Maybe we'll just jump straight to that because I kind of I kind of got it solved over here. Anyway, needless to say, this one will um, will track back until the reflection starts to wiggle around. It will get a little bit confused with it going off screen and stuff like that. And and what I was going to do was just gradually switch off some of these points until I get a. Actually, I'll do it because it doesn't take very long. Here we go. Uh, that's a fairly good lineup on that. Uh, snap it. I'm going to go backwards. Um, again, I'm leaving it at default and see what it does. So far, so good. So far, so good. I might be losing a little bit because of this reflection, but it's coping. It's gone orange and it's gone yellow. And then it's gone out. You can see it's gone. Oh, it's gone terrible, right? Well, let's get it back to where it was kind of, where it was kind of good. Here, snap. Um, so this time I'm going to go and turn on lighting and occlusions because it's going to go off the bottom of the screen. And let's, why not? Let's go red, green, blue. See if it will make use of those bright pink tracking markers that we've got. Okay, let's see. So now it's a little bit slower because it's doing a little bit more calculating. Oh, no, nah, it doesn't like it at all. So what I think the problem is that we've got coming up is that the, uh, the, the reference frame has got a big, um, a big reflection on it. But then moving forward, the reflection goes off. And that's a big part of what it's trying to track here. It's trying to track the um, the center of the phone. It's got the it's got the bevel and stuff, but it's not uh, it's not really um, it's not really seeing that. It's seeing the entire shape. Right? If I have a look, you see the, the big black reference mark on this. So let's let's uh, let's do a G mask to hold out the uh, the center point of the phone. And let's just use the solid um, solid bit that is the um, that is the bevel, the tracking markers, and not get hung up on the uh, on the reflection like that. There we go. Um, I'm going to track. This is just to help me with my G mask um, illusion. Adjust offset as always. Just offset as always. Yep. Uh, okay. Cool. I'm just gonna correct for this movement a little bit. There we go. Uh, I should ignore the perspective grid. It's confusing. Me. There we go. Cool. Oh, 
that'll do for now and then it will go off and yep cool 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 so go back to my perspective grid f8 view see where it was last good i mean i could do i could do a quick stabilize just to see where my last good was this front end looks good then it wigs out there i can just see it so i'll, I'll take my uh i'll take my last good frame as being frame 20. f8 snap this time i'm going to use media um g masks to exclude and you'll see now my uh if i turn my g mask on you'll see that my reference frame should exclude the g mask there actually it's gone really uh, bad but if i not have a good keyframe on that it's good no. to see your thought process here, like seeing what you're checking for and what you're looking for. Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. Go back to my perspective grid, F8 snap. Right, let's try and link this home. So I know it's not going to work completely because I've done this demo a couple of times, but it's better now. It's better, better. And then it starts to go a little funky. Yeah, it's good, actually. I think we may have got it home. Oh, yeah. Not bad. So I'm stopping it. I'm, I'm pressing as many keys as possible to stop it from. So this is where this is where I say, well, now I start to downgrade some of these things. So I can see that the perspective is going a bit wacky. So uh, I'm going to go to snap it around frame 10. I'm going to turn off perspective and see if I get a better result. Oh, I actually failed completely too. But... So snap it on that. I'm going to turn off skew, scale and rotation. I'm just going to try and I'm going to delete those keyframes for a second and that one, because what that'll do is that leads the uh, lead to my perspective grid a little bit. All right, there we go. That's and a great I tip. I, I think that might be solving a problem that I had where like if you leave yeah. the keyframes still there, it gets confused. That's a good tip. Yeah, no, it is good, isn't it? Okay, still not getting it. So the other thing that I tend to do when it comes to this is is just let it ride. Just let it ride out. And then um, it might not be the best stabilized for the last few frames, but then I can always you can have a look at this one. I can always just fix it. Um, I can always just fix it later. Uh, I'll attach it now. Let's see where we're at. 2D invert and see what we've got. Hide my G mask. There we go. We've got the phone quite good. For most of it and then as it gets down here it just kind of falls away this wasn't the best live demo to do but here was one that i had made earlier so it wasn't perfect we had the uh we had the phone screen bend away from us a little bit but that's something i can fix i am actually just doing it for cleanup and screen insert so see where it, um the corner is bouncing around a little bit well look it wasn't an easy track and i can fix that with my screen grid so when i put it in i'll show you what i mean with my next one so this is an actual real world example that I did in the commercial and it's pretty it's pretty complicated we've got we've got depth of field we've got low light we've got a hand coming into shot actually it's a few more frames than what I've got here here we go we've got a hand coming into shot here so again if you I've don't got, mind uh, could I just quickly show the this spot just so people can see the final result yeah, in context yeah. so yeah. I, I have it here so I think I can oh geez do I have the right one loaded yeah I do So there's a little bit of an That's intro really... here. It's nicely shot, and it's a really cool commercial. And I think the screen just looks so good. I couldn't get over it. There it is. <laughs> oh, beautiful. I love a good screen. I, I love a good screen. Look at that. Do I have the ability to pause it? I do. So I'm just going to scrub a little bit here. Beautiful. Beautiful screen comp. And then here, the glow. Oh, it's beautiful. It's perfect. So this, this was a job where I was supervising on, and um, it's a good opportunity for me to get um, the material that I want. And my general rule of thumb is this, that I want uh, my phone screens off to get the best reflection. Um, in low light, I always have uh, DOPs telling me, well, no, we need to give it some illumination. We need to, we need to give, give it off some light. And there are some um, VFX phone screen apps out there um, that are really useful, but they can also be dangerous. And if you, if you're not in attendance and you give them the app, you can guarantee that they will use it badly. They'll put far too many tracking markers on the screen. Um, this, the, uh, the, the in-app tracking markers 
are underneath the glass. So any reflections that go over the top of the screen will take off those tracking markers mm -hmm. and you won't be able to use them anyway. Um, the illumination that they put on the screen will be far too bright. They'll have the phone brightness up. So yeah, so generally a safer, a safer bet for me is to say, uh, please keep your phones off if I'm not, if I'm not on the set anyway, um, please keep your phones off. Use tiny uh, white squares in the corners. I don't know if you guys um, have that correction pen. Do you know that whiteout uh, correction pen? Yeah, definitely. At a pinch, at a pinch, you can use that little drops of those in the corners. They're perfect. They're nice and small. But what I tend to do is I carry a little, um, I carry a little kitchen chopping board around with me uh, on shoots like this with lots of white squares already cut up with a Stanley knife, uh, ready to go at a moment's notice. So, um, so these are little white squares stuck on. Um, but yeah, the um, the the action of her bringing her hand in um, was creating a lot of problems for this originally. So I, I've I've done quite a few um, different tracking markers, uh, sorry, different snapping and um, perspective grids. And uh, towards the end, like I said, I eventually turned off everything but scale. You can see down here. So I so I start on frame one with all my noise on, and then as it gets towards the phone, I'm getting nothing but scale and position. So that as she, uh, she's 172, 172 frames. So as she then pulls her phone off, all I'm getting is the um, is the basic uh, tracking movement. So you can see that my stabilize isn't the best that it could be. It's got a little bit of a bend and a warp. But like I said, this is already making my job much easier than the original shot here. So I'll I'll work with it. If I need to do further stabilizing with an extended by cubic, then I'll do that. But normally what I do is. I will just um, I'll just stretch my phone screen onto it, but this is already, you know, half my bowel, more than half my bowel. So it's great. So it's a great stabilize. And if, yeah, if you don't it's... mind, I have a question, and, and Shannon has a question as well. Well, this is Shannon's oh, yeah, question, but I I would like to mirror it because when I whenever I do my planar tracking in Flame, I don't know why, mm. but I seem to default to auto update reference. Oh yeah. You everything that you've done today, you have not used auto update reference. Can you speak a little bit to that? Well, uh, since this demo did not go too well for me on this one, this one might have been a an example where it might have helped. But imagine that you are getting minute errors on your track throughout the shot, and you've got auto update on. Then your uh, your tracking points will slowly drift. Your minute errors will just build up, build up, build up, build up, build up, and by the end of the shot, uh, it would have drifted off. Uh, in fact, do you remember Jeff when I I demoed this with you yesterday, and I was like, well. I'm not sure why I've lost all my keyframes at the start here. And it's kind of not complete. I think that's what was happening with me. I think I was drifting, 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 drifting. So I decided to uh, delete all my keyframes. But yeah, if you if you have auto update on, then it's looking, it's ga it's gaining a brand new reference every frame. Yeah, every Many frame. Many errors will just accumulate, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a way of um, not accumulating errors. But again, this might have been a, an example where it would have, it could have helped me. Let me just see if it will. I think the answer to the question, Shannon, is maybe try doing your tracking without it and see what happens and just use it as another yeah. tool, like another thing to turn well, on or off. Exactly. It's, it's part of my, um, my hierarchy of buttons that I'll work through if my track's not working. But I would say there's a general rule of thumb, even, even when it's simple 2D tracking, um, to, uh, to not turn on auto update because, yeah, we've got noise in our footage and then that can throw off the tracker. And yeah, generally I find that they drift quite a lot when that happens. That's great. I mean, I that's a big le lesson learned for me that I'll be trying. That's for sure. So thanks for that. But yeah, let's yeah, keep cool. going. Keep going into this. All right. Track. So so I get I get a I get a reasonably good uh, stabilize on this, and then my uh, my workload is 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 eased. So I've got um I've got a few paint nodes here, just doing uh, sequence paint on the tracking markers that go under the hand. So obviously, as as the hand comes into shot, I've now got really weird boils on my hands. So then that gets dealt with, uh, with a restore paint. And then there is just some frame by frame painting. I can't, I think on frame 135, I've just done just some frame by frame, uh, painting, not sequential, just to, oh, there it is just towards the end of the shot. I've just, um, just oh, it's the, it's the marker under the hand that was getting quite tricky. So, the, so that central, that central tracking marker, I actually think, yeah, so the hand, the hand covers it up and then just for the last few frames, it reveals it. So I was just doing some, uh, extra painting on that. And then up here, I'm just doing the upper tracking markers, which are consistent throughout the shot, but um, as in the paint strokes and the stabilize can be consistent. But I think what I ended up doing was just freezing it 
just taking that um, that frame of the uh, top of the phone, and I rebuilt the top of the phone using a still frame, um, and just graded it as this lighting changes down here. So um, I've just done a uh, an output from my action where I've just cracked in my uh, paint blobs. It's difficult to see because I've put them on black, but they're my paint blobs there. And then I've just done um, a grade and a recomp using a comp node up here where I've just used a still painted frame of these tracker markers to paint out the top ones because they were much easier and I wanted a little bit more consistency. It's also the ones that you're kind of looking at the most. Um, and if you remember, my, um, my stabilize wasn't perfect here, so you see it wiggling around. So I was able to, um, I think I used uh, a skew here. Uh, so I've got a track on the original tracking markers. And then this axis here is just doing a little bit of skew just to uh, just to put them into the right position. Anyway, uh, where's my actual setup here? Oh, here we go. So I um, cleaned up the phone thanks to, you know, thanks to having it stabilized. It's taken me a lot less time than it would have if I was trying to clean it up without having it stabilized. But also now, um, not just for cleanup, but also for doing the phone screen insert, um, I can, I can, build my phone screen, whether it's got animation or whether it's just a, a static uh, graphic, I can build it all on a flat, you know, squared up um, image and it will be a lot easier. Um, I wanted to show you a little trick that I discovered inside this setup um, that isn't necessarily about perspective grid, but um, so I, I was provided the artwork and um, all I was doing was just scaling it, uh, scaling it down to put inside the phone nicely. Well, I wanted to have rounded corners like the uh, like the device does. So um, my scale down, I'm just stealing the matte output. And I don't know if anyone else um, uses this trick, but if you blur your matte and then up the contrast, you get beautifully rounded corners uh, without too much effort, without having to you know make some classic Bezier splines. Oh, that's or good. I don't think yeah, I've done that before. <laughs> that's it's good. A blur and, and then a contrast. And the contrast is just you know really... Um, Bringing, bringing in the blacks and whites again. So you could do it with the 2D. History. That's a classy thought, rounded edge right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that in my setup. I said, oh, yeah, I must show that. Um, that is good. So um, using using my stabilized phone, I'm going to use the one with the tracker markers for now because, like I said to you, it's not the perfect uh, stabilized. So I, I'm going to use the tracker markers so that I can skew my um, screen insert. But again, still a much easier challenge than trying to do the screen insert without the phone having been straightened up for me. Um, so this part of my setup is just the phone screen insert. And then what's interesting up here is this is my hand over the top. So I'm gonna do a bit of prep work on my hand. It's massively out of focus, so I'm gonna have edge issues. So um, using the stabilized plate, I can create my hand mask. And then I've got two processes, one where I expand my hands out quite aggressively and then one pixel where spread. I extend my screen. Yeah, pixel spread, um, where I extend my screen in. And the reason for this is because I'm going to grade the phone. I'm not going to. I'm not going to traditionally uh, comp this phone graphic onto the device. I'm actually just going to grade up the phone that's there, so I can keep all the reflections. I can keep all the detail on it. Um, so my output of my phone screen is just added onto the top of the phone and, and noodled to a nice uh, degree that I think will be uh, believable, knowing that I'm going to put some glow on uh, further down the track. So that's just added onto it. And I've kept all of my, um, my artifacts. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fairy lights in this, um, in this environment. So there was a lot of weird reflections on the phone um, that I wanted to keep. Um, but if I hadn't prepped the screen, then I'd be getting real burnout where the hand is you know on the soft defocus bit of the hand that would be really super bright it's the hand is so much brighter than the phone so that would be yeah that. i think a lot of us so, have run into this same issue and maybe the truth is that we just left it at a subpar comp to be honest because we weren't sure how to do it so this is great keep going please so, um, so now so now i've got um i've got my phone screen uh fixed corrected and added on and i've got my hand massively extended so now I can um, I can combine my phone screen and my hour. Oh, I add a little bit of glow. I've also got another thing that I absolutely love, which is Airglow. I don't know if you guys have come across it. Airglow is one of our matchboxes, and um, it just gives a nice um, progressive exponential blur um, to whatever you're putting it on. But I um, I'm using it here on my phone screen, 
I'm using, I'm cutting the hand out and I'm glowing on my phone screen, but then I'm adding the glow to my hand so that the edges of my hand, when I do my final comp, have got that kind of glow edging on from around the, uh, the phone. Um, here we go. This is my perspective grid, putting the movement back on so I can put my screen insert back on. And here I am using the glow and I'm just putting the move back on the glow so that upstream I can just noodle my glow in. And there we are. We've got my, um, oh, that's my glow sneaking on around the edges of my hand. The other, the other trick I would recommend, and I do this with graphics sometimes as well, I'm building a, uh, a complicated BFX on my timeline, but I know they're going to want these graphics fading up, fading down. And like with this phone, I knew that when the phone lit up was going to be um, tricky um, or, you know, a, a, a contentious point. So rather than try and, you know, animate uh, the screen on, I'll just do two versions. I'll do a version with the phone clean. I'll do a version with the phone on. And then this is much easier for client attendance to have just two, just two, um, two images. So mm -hmm. I can choose when the uh, phone screen lights up. That's a great or trick. Was, yeah. Or if it was graphics in my timeline, rather than having that graphic have a fade up, fade down, I'll just have it on a, on a BFX with the graphic that I need and BFX with the graphic where I don't need it. And then I can just do a timeline dissolve or whatever it is that they want in the graphics. And it happens much quicker. Um, it's much more responsive for the client. So this is, this is great. Go. Richard, uh, I don't know if anyone's going to ask, but uh, could you, for me, because I'm the idiot here, could you just walk through again the like blowing the hand out, shrink or blowing the screen out, shrinking the sh hand in, and just kind of talk us through that section a little bit slower, just so yeah, just so, just so yeah. I can see it because I don't get it yeah. yet, and okay, so I, I have to believe someone is... else. I won't say the hand is obvious, but the hand is easier to explain first of all. So I have got a mat. Uh, oh, I've got a mat. That was true. So I've got a mat. And where we have non-solid pixels, where we've got non-white pixels, we are picking up um, some of the background. So, uh, for example, if I look at the skin on the hand, I don't know if it's that obvious. Let me turn on off filtering. I turn off filtering so I can see pixels. Still can't see pixels. Why can't I still see pixels? Filtering is off. Uh... Oh, I can see pixels now. Okay, cool. Where you've got non um, non solid pixels, you're picking up uh, fifty percent skin, but also fifty percent screen. So this part of the uh, hand has got some black in it. It's 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 starting to get the black edges of it. And yeah. if you don't do some treatment to it, uh, even though your mat is also uh, falling off, um, there's still fifty percent of the pixel information there. So it may only be fifty percent of my pink hand. But that pink hand has also got 50% of the black screen. So you're going to get edges. So um, I can remember the day when I found out this technique. I was relatively young and it was the uh, film boys that were using it. Um, the commercials guys hadn't learned the trick and we were all just dragging and, you know, frame by frame, dragging out the edges and stuff like that. Um, and they, uh, yeah, they said, oh, yeah, pixel spread. Have you guys not been using it? It drags the pixels out. We're like, oh, my God, it changed my life. Yeah. So, so you I take the mat the and you put it into the pixel spread and you set the stretch yeah. and now the hand is yeah. stretched way out so that we have that. Yeah. There's a couple of options, stretch or parallax, and um, you, know, you choose it uh, to see what suits. Um, parallax can be a little bit uh, bubbly and wobbly. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit carried away with pixel spread. I love pixel spread. Anyway. <laughs> But the obvious thing to do is to treat your edges and, and pixel spread does that beautifully. Um, so we've got an expanded edge and I'm just being careful not to, uh, not to affect too much of the image because I know that I'm going to be restoring, where is it? I'm going to be restoring quite a significant part, part of the phone. And I don't want these parts of my hands to be as stretched out as that. So I'm just using uh, a basic screen mat just to make sure that my hand edge is only expanded out as far as I need it to. Otherwise you get some weird, weird effects but that's a hand sorted so now when i come to comp the hand using um using that mat no longer will i get a 50 percent black edge where my pixels start to fade off i will be solid skin all the way to the edge of my mat but then the reason for doing the pixel spread on the phone screen if i turn it off actually if i bypass it yes it will remove my cache and your live demo will not go as well okay fine you'll see that when i add my screen onto it you see this bright part, which is my hand? It's dangerously close to where my hand is about to be restored to. And there you go. That's exactly what I've got. So I've got my phone screen 
has now got a bright orange edge around it. And that's because the phone screen that I'm grading has got a bright pink hand in the shot. So the pixel spread on the screen helps me do that. Now I have, I've got to deal with some stretchy reflections, but that will be happening underneath the hand, hopefully. So I could probably live with it. And it means that when I add my phone screen on, grading the, the, the shot as opposed to comping the shot, um, you're not going to have that bright edge around gotcha. the, of the context. That makes sense. That's great. Thanks for that right. careful explanation. Yeah, yeah um, that, that's the kind of, that's the, that's the dirt you want to avoid, that, that kind of weird edging. As is tradition, time has flown by, and this has basically been a perspective grid show, and I did promise oh, the audience, hey. I promised them so that we would sh talk about um, sky replacements and uh, frequency separation. But before we go, maybe we can save the um, magazine one for the patrons chat. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will, I will tease the magazine to uh, incentivize Oops. Oh, geez. What have I done? I failed. Um, hold on one second. I am. So here, here's what we're going to be showing in the, um, here's the next, <laughs> the patrons chat thing. This is what Richard was going to show us. This is a cool commercial that Richard worked on. And the shot in question is a magazine. Oh yeah. Just to show it's not just phone screens, right? Yeah, that you can use the perspective grid for more than just that. So this is this was a great one, getting this onto the magazine there. Uh, that's going to be fun. But before we move on to the next topic, uh, we did have a question from Ralph. He wanted to know, um, you avoid using the 3D perspective grid because you can't un uh, you can't invert that one. It's it's like not really yeah. is usable in this context. Is that right? Yeah, that's that that's that's my understanding that the. Um... The 3D uh, perspective grid doesn't have an invert button. Yeah, I wonder so what that's no... used for then. I guess just uh, do well, it going 3D, one so, direction. So I, well, no, I've, I've dabbled with it before. Um, uh, because I, as I showed the, um, when you, when you um, let's try it on this one where, where I apply the, um, the screen. Uh, so but because it's moving around in 3D space, you could use, um, image-based lighting or a reflection uh, somewhere uh, off screen to, to, uh, to apply a reflection or shimmer to the, um, to the phone screen. Sometimes, you know, the phone screens are shot really flat or um, uh, they don't really have much life. Well, because this, this plane is now moving in 3D space, you could have a reflection map on it or you could use image-based lighting and your phone screen would now give off a realistic um, kind of shimmer and reflection. So there are, there are some good uses yeah. to it. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's let's quickly talk about some of the um, frequency separation things that you, uh, you we were can, showing yeah. me yesterday. Yeah, we can keep it real uh, trim because it's, again, I, I quite like the idea of this topic being, um, I really like, and frequency separation, um, do you do it like this? Because I know it's the, um, a lot of people are doing it with um, uh, subtract, so their frequency separation looks like that. Um, I should briefly talk about what I mean by frequency separation. So um, frequency separation is is a technique by uh, where what you start again, a technique where you are trying to separate uh, the low frequency from an image and the high frequency from an image. And it's easier visually. So if I if I show you the low frequency of this image, it's it's blurry, it's mostly the color and it's not got none of the detail. And I get I achieve that just by blurring. So it's just a gouging blur. And I uh, blur it just enough to remove the detail of an area that I might be doing cleanup of. Um, now you can do a subtract and that gives you the result of everything that isn't the low pass. And so therefore that must be the high pass. And then you can do some paint work on it. So you, maybe you're tidying up some grass or something. And then in order to put it back, you do the opposite uh, function of whatever it was that you did to get your, um, your high pass. So in this case, it'd be add and add high frequency over the low frequency gets you your image back exactly how it was. Now I do it a slightly different way and it is a little bit more obscure, but um, same blur. Uh, but what I do is I invert it using the negative and then I use a comp node that just gets it 50% back to its original. And that's my equivalent of the high pass. Um, it's obscure in the way that you put it back, which is a Photoshop blend mode called linear light. And, and that applied 
to the low pass. So the high, my high pass over the low pass, keep using Photoshop when you like, puts the image back. Um, but and I'll remember, interject and say, this is the method that I was taught as a random one-off. My mentor knew this method and that's the way that I learned yeah. it. And I think um, if, you, if you look into some other tools, I think Synthize does this. Uh, the Synthize high pass option is mainly used to help tracking. The, the high pass that you get out of Synthize will look like this. And I think there's a matchbox as well. Um, lumps. Um, the, the, the high pass output from that also looks. So I think we're on the right thing there, Jeff. But look, I love the fact that there are many ways to skin this cat. So um, the third I way. saw on Logic Live. Yeah, the third way, which I'd never used before, never seen, which is to uh, take your low frequency, your blur, and divide it by the image. And that's your uh, high pass right there. And then the uh, the inverse of that to put it back is multiply, and they're really great ways. I I I much prefer that look personally. I find that that's a little bit difficult to uh, work with, but they both do exactly the same thing. Yeah. So that so, the dark one was the add subtract. The yes. uh, gray one was the negative fifty percent linear light, and the bright yep. one yep. was the divide multiply. Exactly. Yeah. So how would I use it? Well, I I use it heaps for cleanup and uh i've got a really good example here where um so we, i've just finished this job for uh new zealand lotto and we they wanted to paint out the house right so they, they want us to remove this house which is you would say the dominant feature in this uh in this shop <laughs> so we've got a um we've got a uh, an outdoor field lot that we dressed to look a little bit like an empty field uh to an empty plot sorry and that's been comped in and most of the work's been done but we've got to do this clean up down on the fence where the shadow of the house is hitting everything in. Now we did take a lot of reference photographs as well, but um, I would much rather paint up the original plate where I can. So it looks like if I was just using normal copy brush, I'd ha I'd only have a couple of small portions of the fence that I could use to clone and, and to get rid of the shadow, right? Uh, I'd be getting quite repetition, quite a lot of repetition if I just did copy brush on this fence. But if I do frequency separation, the fence so if i take the fence i blur it just to remove all of the grain detail um and then just do a very um uh kind of lazy drag paint color sample cleanup on the low frequency the low frequency is not a difficult thing even with my limited matte painting abilities um to paint up clean but the real trick the reason that high pass uh, frequency separation sorry comes in handy is that copy brushing the high pass um, enables me now to uh, use almost the entire fence. And I've only really got to worry about these areas where the, um, where the shadow edges are. Now it looks like I can't, um, I can't use this area, but it's, it's actually just a bit of an optical illusion. In fact, I was talking to Jeff yesterday about it. Um, the area that I need to worry about is just this crossover point. If you look at that and I remove the, um, I remove the edge area. We've actually got the same shade happening through, but it feels like it's a completely different shade. The same, um, the same way that that optical illusion there makes uh, it look like A and B are different you shades. You found but it. Actually, I found it. I found it. But that wasn't even the best example. This one, I found another one that was an even better example. So apparently, I say apparently, I know it is, but the, the shade of the top square is the same as the shade of the bottom square. There you go. Wow. I'd not seen this. I'd not seen this one before, but it, That's it, a it, good illustrates, one. My point. it <laughs> illustrates my point much nicer. So therefore, um, I can now, um, I've now got, I can keep most of this wood grain here and all I need to do is just paint out the sides like that and then use my Photoshop linear light to combine these two passes to get to that fence. There's a little bit of cleaning up still to do, but the bulk of the work is done there. Um, and combine it with a couple of others up to the driveway and stuff. And the driveway is using the same technique as well. I've now painted out the shadows from the house. That's great. It's good. That's good stuff. Okay, we have 30 seconds to do Sky Replacement. Go! Uh, sky Replacement <laughs> was just going to be um, an ad. It's, it's all about additive keying, guys. So it was all about, um, you know, you've got your, you've got your skies. Uh, oh, we, your we can go a little bit over. I think this is worth... Let's take our time for a couple... I'm, I'm just kidding about speeding through it. Let's, let's explain this ah, one because okay, I think it's okay. pretty good. It's good. This is a good one. Okay, so um, what, I, what I really... We've just done a series, a, a whole lot of Sky Replacements recently, and and this technique just um, just excited us as, as much as the additive keying excited us. Um, so um, 
what I try and do is uh, grade the plate. It's the same with my screen inserts and it, it, the same goes for my uh, sky replacements as well. Uh, you're going to get a much better result if you can just um, grade your sky into it. Um, and I usually start with um, multiplying the sky over the plate to get me um, most of the way there like that. And um, already I'm feeling like it's, it's looking a lot better but I've got a few problems with uh, clouds in the background and obviously um, clouds passing all the way through the people. So um, the first thing we'll do is we'll solve the clouds in the background. Now, quite often when you're asked to do a sky replacement, it's because there are no clouds in the sky. It's usually, you know, overcast, burnt out or, or, or such like. Um, burnt out is a problem because obviously it also affects all your edges of your trees and stuff like that, but um, you can only work with what you're given. Um, in this case, the problem is the clouds that are already in the sky. So rather than me pulling a key to comp in the sky, I will use my uh, time to actually pull a key on the sky, but use it to clean up the clouds. All right. So by doing um, a, a key on the sky, a blur and a divide uh, object obliterator, I can then comp in a cleanup. And this is where my error comes in. So um, your margin of error might be pulling a key to you can comp the sky. My margin of error in this example is just trying to clean up the clouds in the background. But it gets it's a it's a price I'm gonna have to pay. And and sometimes I can I can pull back as much detail, maybe even more detail than this, and still have it work. But we'll go with this for now. And that's probably as much detail as I'm gonna lose. So that now when I end up mute a couple of things Let's, there we go so now when i come to multiply my clouds over i've not got that clash in the background that i had over here where you can see that the old gold clouds are there i've actually got the beginnings of a really good sky comp now the problem with multiply is that it will often uh, darken areas that you don't want to darken so in order for me to compensate that i will just grade up the plate that i'm using on the multiply so i've got my uh, Color correct node here, and I'm just going to offset, lift up my black so that now my um, my multiply isn't darkening down my dark points of the uh, of the plate. So I'm just going to. Oh, that was already was complex to take I'm constantly looking back to my um, plate just to make sure that I am similar. Good. I'm mostly concentrating on this horizon line. Good. But also from now on, I will just grade everything else. So if my sky is looking a bit grubby and my clouds aren't pinging up, well, I'll just, I'll just grade up my clouds before they go into multiply. So there we go. The other great trick that I love is, well, I've kind of got these clouds passing through the plate. Um, well, rather than pull a mat and again, compromise my edges, I'll just blur the clouds in that area. So there we go. So I'm using my mat that I pulled earlier to clean up the clouds. and I'm using a matchbox called mask blur blur the plate so that now my multiply is looking even better because now I've not got my clouds uh, making my horizon look semi-transparent and if you're just looking at the sky area I'm already on the way to a winner with that um, by changing the clouds and by changing the sky you're also going to be changing the lighting so the fact that it's having quite an impact on my shot is not necessarily a bad thing in fact sometimes it's really handy to have that otherwise you've got this really kind of weird disconnect so now the only thing I need to think about is doing a, um, a quick restore and I'll just do a very um, soft restore on my, um, on my plate there. And I've got my beautiful uh, sky replacement. That's great. Are. That was, that was succinct too. That was wonderful. Very cool technique. <laughs> very great result. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm always keen to, to maintain as much detail as possible. So, um, like with additive keying, you're trying to you're trying to keep every single hair, every single kind of detail. So here I'm trying to keep as much information that there was on the horizon line, um, but you know, not not have um, not have bright white edges or anything like that. It so, looks yeah. great, and I can see you're you're even getting the um, the water reflections for free, aren't you? Yeah, well, oh. that was that was a choice. So I, how much I restore of this um, yeah. of this sky? You can see my mat's quite thin up here. Mm -hmm. My mat's really thin down here, and and I'm just doing a little bit of cheeky, cheeky blue water. Otherwise, it would look a little bit weird. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's great. Oh, 
Thank you so much, Richard, for, for everything, showing us all this stuff today. Really great stuff. Everyone was loving it. There, there were a couple questions that we got through, and it was good. Um, thanks for that. Um, I guess I'll see you for part two in the patrons Q&A, and then any questions that people have can answer them, uh, ask them there. But for now, I think uh, I'll see you there, and it's time for prize time. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Okay, everyone. It is prize time and i think i'm ready i have almost i was so entranced with with everything that i almost missed it but um prize time here we are oh there we are today's lucky winner here oh man i'm all over the place uh <laughs> oh there's my head i found it Okay, today's lucky winner will be walking away with a Logic Notebook. I've loaded the attendees into the sheet, and let's see who will be the winner of a notebook. It is Theana Leone. Congratulations, you're walking away with a Logic Notebook. And it wouldn't be Logic Live if we didn't give away Boris FX Optics. So why don't we do one more roll of the wheel and see who's walking away with a copy of Boris FX Optics. It is Valentin Andreev. Congratulations, Valentin. And let us move on to the slideshow. Keep your eyes peeled for any upcoming shows. We will be announcing them all in all the usual places. A couple of brewing, but nothing solidified just yet. Uh, if you haven't already signed up with the forum, head on over and do so at forum.logic.tv. While you're there, why don't you also sign up and head on over to the Logic Discord, where we're having some of our more informal chats and hangouts. This episode of Logic Live will be available on the website later on today. We have some relatively new episodes of the Logic Podcast, Glenn Teal chatted with none other than John Ag, who is uh, here today. Uh, very similar time zone as Richard Betts, actually, so thank you for being here so early. Uh, again, he's similar to Richard, and if you've poked your head in the Logic community, you certainly know his name. He's the flame artist of Australia, in my mind, and uh, pretty amazing at what he does, everything from editing to finishing and everything in between, all on flame. Check out the podcast and learn about his story. We have reached 1,800 subscribers on YouTube, specifically 1,886. Just keeps growing. That is the goal. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. It does help. If you'd like to support what we're doing here on Logic, become a patron by signing up at patreon.com slash logic TV. Congratulations to the winner, winners of today's giveaway. Be sure to check out the Logic merch store to pick up your own Logic merch, especially your notebooks, AirPod cases, and phone cases. Big thank you to Boris FX for sponsoring Logic Live and being here today. If you'd like to save 15% on everything they make, you can use the code LOGIC-2023 at checkout. Thank you to AJA for also sponsoring Logic Live. They've been together with Flame since 2006. And a final thank you to Hotspring, the future of VFX outsourcing, connecting you to other artists from around the world to help get your projects done. You can find them at thehotspring.com. And that brings us to the end. Oh, no. Oh, my God. What have I done? That brings us to the end of our show. <laughs> Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Where is the music? There's the music. Uh, thank you so much, Richard, for logging in so early uh, on a Sunday. Richard is generous to, enough to give us one more hour of his time with the patrons Q&A over on Zoom. If you didn't get that uh, email, let me know. I can throw that over to you now. Uh, we're going to look a little bit deeper into some other breakdowns and answer any questions you might have for him. I'll see the patrons over there. But for now, thanks again to everyone for being here. I appreciate you. We'll see you next time on Logic Live.